All right, good morning and uh, welcome to uh, Thursday morning's lecture. I am recording. Uh, I want to hit a bunch of uh, information before we get to the homework problems. First of all, um, if you did the practice test and uh, emailed it back to me, uh, I have gotten it. I got a bunch of them. I have uh, uh, a couple people sent them to me as an individual file, which was very helpful. Um, several of you sent them as uh, multiple JPEGs, which is fine but I do have to open up each individual one and then put them all into a single document. It takes a little bit more time. If you did not get it emailed to me and you have finished it and you want to frantically email it to me this morning, I will still accept it. If I have it by the end of class today, um, I'll still grade it. Again, it's a practice that is simply designed for um, um, helping you understand how you're going to submit your quizzes and tests. It's extra credit, so if you didn't do it, um, the biggest uh, issue if you didn't do it is that you might not fully understand how to submit your next exam or quiz. So I would encourage you, if you have finished it, to send it to me just so you can get a feel for it. So I'm gonna download them, I'm going to open them in my iPad, and then I will grade them, and then I'll email them back to you individually. I'm also going to do this. I've been doing a lot of thinking over the last couple of days about how we're going to handle this because, again, this this entire um, this entire process is very new to all of us. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going and I'm going to be doing this a lot over the weekend. I am going to create a video for the practice test that goes through all of the solutions. Uh, several of you sent me back. Um, uh, the test and said, oh, I didn't do number three. Apparently number three was a little bit tougher for some folks and that's okay. But uh, it's okay if you didn't do it. it. You won't get points for it, but remember it's just extra credit. So I'm going to create a video that goes through all of those problems so that I don't have to do it in class and take time from that. I am also going to create videos for the homeworks that I assign. And I didn't do that yet. I haven't had an opportunity to, but today we're going to talk about section 12.6. And I am going to, after we're done with class today, I'm going to create a video of the homework for the problems assigned in the 12.6 module. And of course, you know, you can go in and look at that. I've got it in front of me. I'm not going to share it. But um, for example, section 12.6, there are like five homework problems. So I'm going to create a video. I'll call it section 12.6 homework video or something like that. I'll post it into Kaltura and on YouTube. So all of that to say that I am going to create videos for all of the homework. So we are not going to start class by discussing problems unless there's something that just everybody really struggled with. And, you know, I'll be flexible on that. But I definitely want to uh, provide the uh, videos for you because I think that a lot of people will prefer to just go look at the video and say, oh, I see what I did wrong rather than just do it in class. Any questions about that? I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Amaya. Um, like, so for the practice quiz, I know you say you're going to post a video on doing them. Um, if we watch the video, we still can't understand it. Can we still like ask, like, I guess, um, do we need to set a meeting? Because I know for number two, I mean, number one, part B, that was the hardest one for me. And so um, I don't know. I'm just nervous about, like, me not fully understanding. I don't know why I had such a hard time with that problem, yep. but I was able to work it out, but that's my main concern. That's a fantastic question. So if you watch the video, and this is important, by the way, I want to remind you, when I'm looking off to the, to the, you know, to the side, I'm looking at your faces. So it's a little weird, but um, if you watch the video and you still don't understand it, I am happy to go over it in class. And if that takes too much time, then we might need to set something up individually. But in general, if one person really struggled after watching the video, then that probably means either that I didn't explain it well enough or that it was a problem that was just so tricky. I don't write trick questions, but it was tricky in how to solve it that multiple people need to see it. And yes, I am more than happy to go over those problems on the video. Uh, I anticipate that that's going to happen, that the, not every homework problem is going to land with everybody. It, um, the purpose of creating those videos is designed to uh, spend less time demonstrating the homework. And I'm going to be really um, honest with you. We're in a new book this semester. But as I create these videos, you know, for the spring semester, I've got another class just like this, a Zoom class. 
and I'm going to simply reuse the videos on the homework and assign those same homework problems so I won't have to recreate them every semester. So I'm going to do everything I can to be really clear and concise in how I solve the problems because my goal is that you'll be able to understand it from that explanation. But yes, absolutely, Amaya and everyone else, feel free to ask if you have any questions over problems and you just didn't quite understand it from the video. Great question, anybody else? Okay, so um, let me give you a little bit of a uh, heads up on what we're going to do. I, I modified um, the, I didn't modify the test, but I modified the schedule just slightly. So here's what we're going to do. Originally, we were scheduled to have your test on Tuesday. What I've decided to do is I'm going to give you your test next Thursday after class. Okay, so after the class next Thursday, I will upload the, um, the test, you know, in the announcements, I'll, I'll put a link and then you will um, open it up, print it out, work on it, and you'll have until Friday night midnight to get it turned in. So that's, you know, that's all not quite two days, but it's a day and a half to get it done. So Thursday, the, well, what's today the 10th? Is today the 10th? Yeah, I think it's the 10th. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Elena. You're the first person I saw who was confirming for me. I appreciate that. Um, so on the 17th, after class, I will upload the, of the uh, test for you to print out, get completed, and turn it back in by midnight on Friday night. Okay. Um, it will cover everything we've done up to that point, which is going to include today's lecture and next week's lecture over section 6.9. All right. And um, so, you know, the practice test that you just took had some of that stuff on it, but not all of it. You are free to use your book. You're free to use your notes. Um, you're on the honor system that you're not going to go online and try and um, uh, get help from some kind of tutoring system or what have you. Now, I know this might throw Carly off a little bit because she originally planned a test review on Monday. So, Carly, you can think about that and we'll come back to you. Um, and you can let me know if you want to still have that on Monday or if you want to revise it to Wednesday because I know you've got classes and schedules and stuff like that. Um, so you can figure that out. I'm sorry to spring that on you, but I just made that decision in the last half hour as I was kind of prepping for class this morning. Um, but anyway, uh, relative to the practice quiz, there were a couple people who um, said, hey, Mr. Becker, I don't have access to a printer very easily. Can I just write out the problems and scan it and turn it back into you? And for the practice test, I said that was fine and I will accept that. But for regular quizzes and tests, you need to find access to a printer, whether you, whether you have to go to Kinko's or whether you have to go, you know, you know, come up to the campus or whatever, you need to print it out. And um, I've got to have the actual test with all the work on it. So uh, again, I'm giving you plenty of notice on that so that you can have a handle on the best way to uh, get that done and your time frame and so forth. Also, <clears throat> excuse me, and these are things that are occurring to me as we, we go along. Several of you printed out the test and the equations weren't there and you contacted me and said, Mr. Becker, there's no equations here. What that probably means is that your Microsoft Word program did not have the software um, app, for lack of a better word, the plugin called uh, Equation Editor. Equation Editor is something that you can actually get if you go into your Microsoft Word settings and stuff like that. But um, rather than, you know, force you to do that, I can also send it as a PDF. And that's what I did for a couple people who were like, Mr. Becker, I can't read anything on this test other than the words. There's no math equations. So I sent them a copy of the test in PDF. What I will try to do is I'll try to post the test in both Word and um, PDF form. Unfortunately, when I post an announcement, I can only attach one file to it. So on Thursday, when I post the um, the test next week, I'll post two announcements, one in with Word and one with PDF format. Um, if you still are having trouble getting uh, the test after I've posted it in both formats, you need to let me know as soon as possible. Please don't wait until Friday afternoon and say, Mr. Becker, I can't see the test. I will remind you next Thursday at the end of class, as soon as we're done, I'm going to post the test. You need to go in and print it out right away and make sure that you can read it. 
that's got to be on you. If I don't hear from you within an hour after posting the test that you can't see it, um, all bets are off, you know? So I wanna be as reasonable as possible. I wanna be as understanding as possible, but you also have to, you know, you're all adults and you need to be responsible for um, checking this and getting it done, so. Um, other than that, I think that covers everything that I wanted to, uh, wanted to say. Does anybody have any questions or comments or anything? Um, so when we like submit it, is it fine if we submit it through Canvas or do we have to send it like specifically to your email? Uh, well, actually, Emily, great question. What happens when you submit it through Canvas is that it's routed to my email. Oh, are, okay. you the, are you the person who asked that in the email? Is it okay? Yeah. Yes. I'm, I apologize for not responding. Mm -hmm. I got all these emails at the same time. And here's the annoying thing. And it's not anything, you know, at you guys. I get two copies of every email. So I have to go through and, you know, there are 26 or 27 of you in class. So every one of you who submitted a test, I got two copies of the email. And so first thing I do is I go through and I clean up my email and take out half of those emails. And then I go in and I look at them. And I think Jan was the first person to submit. <clears throat> and um, so I opened his up and I believe his was a single file. And so that was very easy. And what I do is here's the process because I want you guys to understand, <clears throat> excuse me. So what I do is if it's a single file, like I think it was for Jan, I um, just save it into a folder in my, I've got, a, I've got a master folder for my M100 Zoom class, and there's a subfolder that says um, uh, practice test. And I just save it with your last name. So I just saved Tapasio and um, put it in there. If it comes in as a document or a PDF, it's just going to be in there uh, that way. So no matter how you send it to me now, then somebody else, I think I'm gonna pick Michelle because I, I think Michelle was somebody, you sent me JPEGs, right, Michelle Serrano? Yep. So I think there were three or four JPEGs. Um, I downloaded each of those and I transported them into a Word document. And then I kind of increased the, the size of them so I could read them real easily. And then I saved it as a file called Serrano and I put it into that folder. So I'm gonna, and after class, I'm gonna go back to my email. I'm gonna do this for everybody else who I didn't have a chance to, to do that yet this morning. Once I have them all into that subfolder, I'm gonna open them all up in my iPad and I'm gonna grade them. And when I grade, uh, if you get a problem right, I, I give it a green check. And if you get a problem wrong, I give it a red X. And that's one of the things I love about my iPad is I can use the colors. So. Once I've got it graded, I will resave it. So it would be Serrano graded or Tapasio graded. And then I will email you back your graded exam and it'll have the number of points that you earned on it. Since this is extra credit, it'll say plus 10 or plus eight or plus five. And I will tell you this, um, and this is for the really lazy people and maybe lazy is the wrong word. This is for the really busy people who just can't get around to it. If you print it out and you put your name on it and you send it to me completely blank, I'll still give you one point because you at least made the effort to try and turn it back to me for an extra credit thing. Now, this doesn't happen very often uh, that I give extra credit, but um, in general, you should definitely try all the problems if you can, but if you can't and it's an extra credit assignment, just do some of it and you'll get some extra points. So what you'll see is um, in your grades, and I'm gonna get this done, let's see, today's Thursday. I'm hoping to get your tests, um, your practice tests graded and back to you by tomorrow. I, I'm a big believer in trying to turn things around and get them back to you as quickly as possible. So um, by tomorrow afternoon, I'll probably have them back to you. And then if you open up the grades um, section, it will have the number of points that you earned under exam one. I don't want you to freak out because exam one is worth 100 points. And so here's what's gonna happen. I, this is important, I'm glad I just thought of this. So let's say that, um, hi Bailey, I see Bailey there. Let's say that Bailey um, got eight points, okay, of extra credit. Well, I'm gonna open up, uh, you know, the grades and I'm gonna put those in. And so Bailey's gonna have an eight today or tomorrow, whenever I get it graded. But that test is worth 100. So that's going to show up as eight out of 100, which is only 8%, which means Bailey is flunking the class. Don't panic, you're not flunking the class. What that means is that when you take the test next week, say you get a, an 83 on the test. 
I'll take that 83, I'll open it up, I'll see, oh, Bailey got eight points already from the extra credit, so I'll add 83 plus eight, which is 91, because I'm a math teacher and I can do that. And I'll change the eight to a 91, and suddenly you'll go from eight out of 100 to 91 out of 100. Does that make sense? So don't anybody panic if you get some extra credit and then you go to your grades and it says F because this was only worth 10 points. Even if you got all 10, it's only going to reflect a 10% at the max until you take your test next week. So I just want everybody to be aware of that um, because I can imagine that if you open it up and we haven't had a test and I did extra credit and I'm failing, that would, that would freak me out. So I don't want to cause anybody any anxiety. One of the, um, one of the uh, things I feel the worst about, one of the events that occurred one time that I felt the absolute worst about was when I was teaching a summer class about six or seven years ago. And I had a student who, um, it was over Memorial Day weekend, and she got an 82% on a test. And I was pleased because she'd been struggling with the class. She got an 82. When I entered the, uh, the score, I inadvertently flipped the numbers and entered a 28. And then I went about my weekend, my Memorial Day weekend, and I didn't check my email. And I opened my email on Tuesday after Memorial Day, and I've got a couple of emails from her, and she's freaking out going, Mr. Becker, how did I get a 28%? And I was like, oh my gosh, you didn't. What happened? And I realized my mistake. I emailed her. I apologized profusely, and, and she wrote back, and she said, well, I'm really relieved, but it did ruin my Memorial Day holiday, thinking I had failed this test. And I felt really bad. So... All that to say that um, you need to check your grades uh, on a regular basis. I put them in as accurately as I can, but I do sometimes make mistakes because I am a human. And if something like that happens where you get an 82 and I put in a 28, you need to catch it because I'm probably not going to go back and check it. All right. So um, I think that covers all of the preliminary stuff that I wanted to talk about. I know it was a lot, but uh, we have a lot of information to cover and I want you guys to be as informed as possible. So uh, one person this morning asked me, she said, Mr. Becker, I'm, I'm driving, but I'm gonna listen to the lecture, is that okay? It, yes, absolutely. Um, if you have to drive, I realize that sometimes uh, things just have to be done and sometimes you have to do that. And as long as you have your, your um, speaker muted so that we're not hearing traffic or anything like that and you think you can follow along just by listening, of course you can always go back and watch the video. So yeah, that's fine. All right, any questions? All right, well, then what I'm gonna do here is, there we go, I'm, I'm just checking to see if anybody else logged in after, there's Daniel Zielinski, I wanna write him down, make sure that I get everybody. Um, we're gonna go ahead and go over the three homework problems on page uh, 339. I'm gonna do that here in just a second. Let me jot down that Daniel Zielinski is here. Let me, let me actually catch up um, anybody I might've missed. Bailey is here. Um, Barbara Carbajal, I thought I saw her. Is she here? Barbara, are you here? Maybe not. Jocelyn Cisneros, are you here? Unmute yourself and let me know. Blaine Getz, are you here? How about Crystal Mays? Okay, so those folks aren't here. That's okay. Um, by the way, I am probably going to um, look at how I grade attendance. Uh, it's got to be a little different in this situation. You know, originally it was every time you miss a class, you lose five points, but I'm probably going to set up like a window where you can miss one or two classes and not lose any points. I'm, I'm still thinking through that, but we need to be a little more flexible in this new um, in this new, I hate the expression, but the new normal, we need to be a little more flexible. So, all right, folks, we are going to look at the three problems, uh, problems 101, 103, and 105 on page 339. I'm going to demonstrate all three of them, and then we're going to move to section 12.6. So, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen to my iPad. Hang on just a second here. All right. And... Okay, can you see my iPad? Yeah. Yes, thank yeah. you very much, awesome. I'm gonna try and expand this if I can. Okay. 
All right, there we go. Okay, so problem number 101 says, the Camdars installed a home security system that included an installation fee of $75 plus a monthly service fee of $25. The total cost of the system is given by C equals 75 plus 25X. Now let me explain that. C is the cost. Um, monthly service fee of $25 means you're going to pay $25 if you have it for one month, 25 times two if you have it for two months, 25 times three if you have it for three months, 25 times 12 if you have it for a year. So that 25X is the variable cost. The $75 is called a fixed cost and the fixed cost is you have it set up and you decide after you know you don't want it anymore you still paid that $75. So that's where the equation comes from. Now this is not written in slope intercept form in this particular problem. If it were written in slope intercept form it would be the other way around. It would be, it would be 25x plus 75. Doesn't matter. That's okay. I'm just letting you know. So the first thing it says is graph C equals 75 plus 25 X for X is less than or equal to 50. Okay, so, oh, no, hang on a second here. I want to draw on here. In black, okay. Why does it keep going to a drawing? I don't want it to go to a drawing. Okay, I got it. All right, so we're going to graph 75, C equals 75 plus 25X. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to let each of these be 10, each of the, um, the scale be 10. So this is like 20, 40, 60, 80, 100. Okay, we need to scale it because of how large the, uh, the numbers are. So C equals 75 plus 25X. And so we're going to pick some values for X and we're going to plug them in and it will tell us what the cost is. Okay, so our ordered pair is XC. And it says do this for X is less than or equal to 50. Okay, so we're going to pick some values that are less than or equal to 50. I'm going to pick some values that are um, easy for us to plug in like 20 and 40. Hopefully those will be easy for us to put in. Let me see here, 575. Okay, so now my scale across the bottom, I'm gonna to have to scale across the bottom because uh, the numbers are a little bit large. So instead of 20, I'm gonna call this 200, 400, 600, 800, and 1,000. So I'm scaling it just a little differently on my x-axis than I did on my y-axis. And that's okay, there's nothing wrong with doing that. Uh, except that I got it backwards. I just realized I got it backwards. Hang on a second. So this is going to be 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. And this is going to be 200, 400, 600, 800, and 1,000. Sorry about that. Again, I'm not going to shy away from it when I make a mistake. So, so when I plug a 20 in, when I plug 20 in for X, all right, 20 times 25 is 500, plus 75 is 575, so I'll graph that point. Uh, 40 is actually going to put me off the graph now that I look at it, so I think that instead of 40, I'm going to pick 30. Okay, and when I do 30 times 25, that's 750, plus 75 is 825. So there are two points that I can graph. So I'm going to go over to 20. And then I'm going to go up to 575. So there's 200, 400, 500, almost up to 600, but not quite. So I'm going to have a point right about there. That's the point 20, 575. And then when I graph the 30, obviously I'm going to start right here. That's 30 right there. I'm going to go up to 825. So that's 200, 400, 600, 800, and just a hair more. And there are two points that we can graph, grabbing a ruler. And it looks like that. Now, in a problem like this, it's not going to go negative because you can't have it for negative months. So it would only be um, in this first area right here. This is called the first quadrant. 
and this problem would only be in the first quadrant. Let me take those out. So there's our line. And then it says, oh, and we just did this. From the graph, estimate the Camdar's total cost after three, 30 months. We just found that, actually. 30 months is going to be 825 right there, $825. Then it says, if their total cost is $975, estimate the number of months of service. So what they're telling you here is what the cost is. They're telling you, OK, 975 is the cost. So how many months did they have the service? And so you solve this equation for the letter X. So obviously we subtract 75 from both sides. Those cancel. You get 900 equals 25X. And when you divide both sides by 25, you get X equals, I believe it's 36. And that's months. So that is problem number 101. Does anybody have any questions on number 101? So for the arrow, like for the line, if we put the arrows on both ends, are we going to get it wrong? No, I wouldn't count it wrong. Because technically it is a line and lines do go in both directions, but you can't have a negative cost. So if this were like a two or 300 level math class, I would probably expect a little more detail from you and, and we'd talk about that. But no, I absolutely would not count that wrong. Who asked that, by the way? Morgan. Morgan. Okay. Thanks, Morgan. Yep. Nope. I would not count that wrong. All right. Any other questions? I don't want to go so fast that anybody feels like I'm um, getting ahead of them. All right. Problem number 103 says determine the number of defects. So this relates to the graph in the middle of page 339. Uh, the top graph on the right shows the daily number of workers absent from the assembly line at JB Davis Corporation and the number of defects coming off the assembly line for each of 10 days. The blue line on the graph can be used to approximate the number of defects coming off the assembly line per day for a given number of workers absent. Now, just from a logic standpoint, it should make sense to you that if you have a company with an assembly line uh, that, I'm just gonna make something up, that makes cars, makes automobiles, and you've got a really good team of, of employees who make automobiles, but then you have some of them absent from work, chances are that the number of mistakes is going to increase. Hopefully that makes sense. So the more workers that are absent, the more uh, mistakes or defects are going to occur. That's what this graph uh, is showing, okay? And we're actually, 12.6 talks about this kind of thing. It's called a scatter plot. These, these points that are kind of all over the place, and there's a line that kind of approximates through the middle of it. Again, I'm assuming that the majority of you have your book, and so you're seeing exactly what I'm talking about. So we're going to go ahead and look at this. It says, determine the slope of the blue line using the two points indicated with ordered pairs. And the two points are, let me make sure that I can do this. So the two points are 0, 9 and... 519. And what that means from, from the problem standpoint is that there are when there are no, no people absent, there are nine defects. So nobody's perfect, right? If everybody on your crew is there, you're still going to have about an average of nine defects in what you're putting together. And if five people are absent from work, you're going to have 19 defects. That's what this means. So it says determine the slope of the blue line using the two points indicated. Now remember the slope formula. Oops, hang on a second. The slope formula is m equals y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. And we have two points. This will be the x value of my first point and the y value of my first point. This will be the x value of my second point and the y value of my second point. And again, those are interchangeable. If you had said that uh, 519 was your x1, y1, and 09 was your x2, y2, it will still work. So um, don't worry about that. I just did it in the order that they occurred. So then the formula is m equals y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, which is 10 over 5 which is two. So the slope of this 
uh, line is two. Then it says using the slope determined in part A, which we just found, and the y-intercept of zero, nine. Remember the y-intercept is your B, so B equals nine. And we know that M equals two. They ask us to determine the equation of the blue line. Well, recall that the equation of a line in slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b. And we know that m is two. And we know that b is nine. So there's the equation of that line. Any questions so far? Okay, then in part C it says, using the equation you determined in part B, which is of course this, that's the equation that we just found. It says, determine the approximate number of defects for a day if three workers are absent. Now remember, the workers are your X, okay? The workers are your X values. When nobody's absent, you have nine defects. When five people are absent, you have 19 defects. Those are your workers. So what they're saying here is in part C, when it says if three workers are absent, they're essentially saying if X equals three, find Y. That's basically what they're saying here. So it's a simple plug-in. You can probably do this in your head. It's gonna be Y equals two times three, plus nine, which is six plus nine, which is 15. So in general, <clears throat> if three workers are, are absent, you're going to have approximately 15 defects. And then letter D says, using the equation you determined in part B, determine the approximate number of defects for a day Oh, no, I'm sorry, I'm reading part C, my bad. It says, using the equation you determined in part B, approximate the number of workers absent for a day if there are 17 defects for that day. So in letter D, they're saying, if Y equals 17, find X. So in other words, you're going to do 17 equals 2X plus 9. And I, I'm running out of space on this page, apparently. So when you subtract nine from both sides, you get two X equals eight. And of course, I think you can solve that in your head, which means X equals four. So if there were 17 defects in a day, there are defects in a day, there were four people missing from work. Any questions on that problem? Okay. Then we're going to go to 105. Give myself plenty of room here to write. All right, and problem number 105 says, the graph below was created with StatCrunch using data from the US Department of Commerce website. So this is actual data. And that's important, you know, sometimes problems like the one we just did, it was a made up company with a made up situation. This is actual data from the US um, Department of Commerce. So kind of interesting. It says the blue dots on the graph uh, show the percentage of all spending on electronics in the United States that was done online for the years 2010 to 2017. And I want you to notice that the line is going up, which is, that means the slope is positive, which means that the, um, percent of electronics being purchased in the US is increasing. And I think that makes pretty good sense. You know, if you think about it, I'm sitting here. Wow, I, I hadn't even thought about it. Okay, I'm sitting here looking at my laptop. I've got a monitor to my right. I've got an iPad to my left. I've got my iPhone sitting right there to help me keep track of time. And this is an Apple pencil. This is an electronic pencil. I have five pieces of electronics within, you know, 12 inches of me. Okay, and I'm one person. I'm sure you all can relate to that. So the, the percentage of electronic sales in the United States is increasing. That makes sense. The red line can be used to approximate this spending. And on the graph, X equals zero represents the year 2010. So let me make sure you understand what that means. 
Zero on the graph means 2010. So one on the graph means 2011. Five on the graph means 2015. Seven on the graph means 2017. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. Um, it says use the points 0, 20, and 7, 34.7 to calculate the slope of the red line. So we'll do that. Um, oops. So they give us the ordered pairs 0, 20. By the way, this is problem number 105. 0, 20, and which is the year 2010. In 2010, there was 20% um, online electronic spending. And then seven years later, it had increased to 34.7. So again, just as a reminder, and I, I'm a big fan of showing you every step. I'm going to change colors just to mix it up a little bit. So I'm going to call this x1, y1, call this x2, y2. We want to find the slope. So the slope is going to be y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1, which is 17.7 .7 divided by 7, which is approximately uh, 2.1. Okay, and that's the slope. By the way, I want to remind you that this number should come out to be positive because this is the slope and the line you can see clearly is increasing. So M equals 2.1. Now let me ask you this, what is B based on the information they've given us? Can somebody tell me what B is? Twenty. Who spoke? Morgan, was that you? Yeah. Yeah, say it again a little louder. Was it 20? It is 20, very good, yep. It is 20 because remember the y-intercept occurs when x equals zero. And we can see right here that when x equals zero, y is 20. So yeah, b is 20, very good. So now we're going to write our equation. y equals mx plus b. That is the approximate equation, or that's the equation of that line that approximates that data. Now I want you to notice, because this is gonna tie into what we're gonna talk about in 12.6 in, um, in a little bit those points are not in a perfect line. What we are doing is we're trying to approximate an equation that fits the line pretty well. We call it the line of best fit. And that's what we're gonna talk about in 12.6 is the line of best fit. Another name for it is linear regression. We're gonna to get to that in a few minutes. So we found that's part B right there. That's the equation of the line. Then it says in part C, using the equation you determined in part B, estimate the percentage in 2016. So in 2016, what does x equal? Remember, if 2010 is zero, then 2016 would be what? Six. Say it again? Six. Six, very good, that is correct. So they're asking us to find y when x equals six. So y equals 2.1 times six plus 20 which is 12.6 plus 20, which is 33.6. And if 32.6, uh, I can do math, I promise. Hang on a second here. 32.6. Again, that was just a careless little mistake. By the way, if you had made that mistake on the test and written 33.6 instead of 32.6 after doing everything, you would have lost just one point. Um, you know, when I make a mistake, it's a good opportunity for me to explain to you how I would have graded that on a test. So um, that was just carelessness on my part. And if you had made that mistake, it would have been carelessness on your part. But a problem like this would probably be worth 10 to 15 points on a test. And losing one point for something small like that is not a big deal. Uh, anyway, then it says using the equation you determined in part B, so using y equals 2.1x plus 20, uh, determine the year in which the percentage was 24, okay? The year in which the percentage was 24. So what they're saying is y equals 24, okay? In what year? 2.1x plus 20. So we're gonna solve this, hang on a second here. 
We're going to solve this equation right there. Okay. So we're going to subtract 20 from both sides. When we do that, the 20s cancel. 24 minus 20 is 4 equals 2.1x. We're going to divide both sides by 2.1. And when we do that, we get x equals, and I know approximately what x equals, but I'm going to pull up my calculator here for a second. Where did bottom of my screen go? Maybe I'm not. Uh, Siri, what is 4 divided by 2.1? It's approximately 1.9, okay, approximately. I'm going to put a little tilde over that. That means approximately equal to. Now, they're asking us for the year, okay? So we need to round that to the nearest whole number. So that would round to 2. And when x equals 2, what year does that represent? Anybody? 2012. 2012. 2012, exactly right. Remember that if 0 is 2010, then 2 would be 2012. Very good. All right. These are examples of linear models. Okay. A linear model, that's kind of a fancy name for um, word problems. I guess that's the best way to say it. It's kind of a fancy name for word problems. And um, that's what we're going to focus on here in section 12.6. So if you would turn, before we do that, I, I want to make sure, does anybody have any questions? Okay, hearing none, turn to page 809, please, in your book. And you might be thinking, my gosh, Mr. Becker, why are we jumping all the way back to page 809 when we're up in, in the 300s now and jumping to chapter 12, especially when we're going to do stuff in chapter 12 at the end of the semester. Chapter 12 is the st statistics chapter, and it is the last chapter that we will do. However, the, um, the content of 12.6 is all about graphing lines and linear models, which is what we're talking about now. So that's why we're going to have this section uh, all the way at the back of the book. Okay? So they give a really nice explanation of what linear correlation is at the top of page 810. Um, I don't generally read out of the book, but every once in a while when I feel like a, an explanation from the book is probably just as clear or better than my trying to explain it, I do that. So what is linear regression and correlation? Well, first of all, the word correlation. You, need, you know that co means with, right? Like, so if you cooperate with somebody, you're operating with somebody, you're working together, okay? Correlation or correlation, the word... Um, Co means with, and relation, things that relate to one another. So correlation is finding a line, linear correlation is finding a line that relates to the data. That's what correlation is, okay? Uh, correlation is used to determine whether there is a relationship between two quantities, and if so, how strong the relationship is. And that's important. How strong is the relationship? Because we can find a line of best fit but it's not a good fit at all. It's the best, but it's not good. Let me give you a great example. I like this example. We've all gone clothes shopping and we've all found an item on the shelf that we really, really liked and wanted. And we've all taken it back to the fitting room and put it on and the fit just, just wasn't quite right. So usually what we do is we go back out to the shelf and we look for the same style shirt or whatever it is that you're trying on, the same, the same style of clothing in a different size. And we might find, you know, let's say that the shirt is just too big on us. We go back out and we find uh, two more of the exact same shirt, but they're in two sizes smaller. So you take both of those smaller shirts back to the, to the changing room, you try them both on, and you find the one that fits the best. Can, can we all identify with that? We've all done that, right? Now, you're going to buy the one that fits the best. Say, for example, you go and you find a shirt that you really, really like. Um, and I'm going to use men's sizes here because I'm a man and I understand them better than others. Um, you find a shirt that you really like, but it's in 
such a huge size that it doesn't fit well. Now I used to weigh more than, you know, I've lost 120 pounds, but you know, there was a time when I was wearing three X and four X clothes. Uh, so say that I find something that was in a four X and I like it and I want to buy it, but I take it and I put it on and it's hanging on me like a bag. And I go back out and I find the exact same shirt, but the only other shirt on the shelf is just in a medium. Okay. So obviously I wouldn't even try it on, but say that I did and it was, you know, I couldn't even get it over my head. So now I have this shirt in a medium and I have the same shirt in a four X, neither of them fit very well, but one of them fits best. The one that's a four X, even though it hangs on me like a, ba a bag, it's the best fit. Is it a good fit? No, it's not. Okay. So when we're doing this and how this relates to um, uh, lines, is that we can always find an equation for the line of best fit. We can always find an equation that fits the best, but is it a good fit? Is it a strong relationship? Is there a good correlation between the equation of that line and the data? Okay, so that's what this means when we talk about looking for um, finding the line of best fit. Uh, regression is used to determine the equation. Now we're going to talk about that. And there are other types of correlation. There's quadratic correlation. There's exponential correlation. We're not uh, a regression, I'm sorry. Um, exponential regression, uh, polynomial regression. We're not going to get into any of that. We're just going to look at lines. By the way, um, most of you, maybe not all of you, but many of you are going to have to take K300, which is a statistics class. If you're a psychology major, uh, I believe if you're a nursing major, I think you're going to have to have K300. If you can get a good handle on this section and the rest of chapter 12 at the end of the semester, you're going to be ahead of the game when it comes to your K300 because you're going to have a good understanding of how to start. Anyway, so we're looking for a number. When we look for a correlation, we're looking for a number. It's called the linear correlation coefficient. It's a fancy name. Uh, we use the letter R to represent it. And R does not represent any units. It's not like inches or feet or yards or miles or anything like that, but it's just a number. And it describes how strong the linear relationship is between two variables, X and Y is typically what we're going to be doing. A positive value of R means a positive correlation, a negative value of R means a negative correlation. And the number that you find we're going to plug stuff into a formula. The number that you find will always fall between negative one and positive one. Okay, so think of a number line where the, not even a number line, a number segment where you've got positive one and negative one. Okay, so obviously in the middle of those two things is zero. The closer you are to positive one or negative one, the better the correlation. If you're really close to zero, there's no correlation. There, there's, it's not a good line of fit at all. Okay. And they show us this on page 810. There's a little number line there that shows you that the closer you are to negative one, you have a strong negative correlation. And by the way, uh, if it's a negative, that means the slope of your line is negative. And if it's a positive, that means the slope of your line is positive. All right. Now, we just looked at what are called scatter plots or scatter diagrams. We're going to look at another one. And um, Oh, this ties into the, one of the problems that we talked about, similar to one of the problems we talked about <clears throat> a couple minutes ago. So it says on page 810, <coughs> excuse me, there's a table for a six-day period at Egan Electronics. So this is similar to the, um, the defect problem we did with the workers um, in the previous section, okay? So there are six days. You can see um, on page 810, days one, two, three, four, five, and six. The top value is the number of workers who were absent on a given day, and the bottom value is the number of defective parts that were produced. Now, again, you would think that the more people who are absent, the more defective parts that uh, exist, and that may be true in general. So think of the top line, the number of workers absent, as your X values, and the bottom line, the number of defective parts, are your Y values. So these are ordered pairs. So you've got 315 and 522 and 07 and 112, 220 and 630. Now, if you look over at page 811, and again, if you don't have your book, um, I'm, this is really hard to follow. So it's really important that you have your book. They have graphed these points. Now you can clearly see that these points do not form a line. 
but they do generally go upward, which means that in general, the number of workers who are absent, as the number increases, the number of defects increases. What we want to do is, we, uh, what we would want to do here is to find out if there is a relationship between the number of workers absent and the number of defective parts by finding the linear correlation coefficient. And that's what we're going to work on. I think that we're going to use, yes, we are going to use these problems to find that, um, these numbers to find that correlation coefficient. All right. So if you turn over to page 812, now I'm going to write this formula out. Folks, I know that the formula that we're about to look at, and some of you are probably looking at it already at the top of page 812, it looks horrible. It looks really scary. And I'm going to do everything in my power to demystify this formula for you. So let me share my iPad here. And we're going to talk about the formula. This is the formula for finding the linear correlation coefficient, OK? Again, I'm going to assume that there are hopefully not more than a couple people, but I'm going to assume that there are a couple people who don't have their book yet. So I am going to write out this formula. So we are trying to find the letter R. Okay. Now, before we do that, I'm going to introduce a symbol. Uh, it's this symbol right here. Does anybody know what that Greek letter is? Does anybody recognize it or know what it's called? Is it summation? It does mean summation. Very, who said that? Me, Gabriella. Gabrielle, thank you very much. It does mean summation. It's actually the Greek letter sigma. And what does it mean, Gabriella? You said summation. What does it mean when you sum something? What does summation mean? What are you doing? Um, adding it together. Yes, very good. You're adding it together. Excellent. In fact, the word sum comes from the Greek word sigma. Okay? So excellent, excellent, excellent. I want you guys to understand that anytime you see that scary looking sim symbol there that, that is the Greek letter sigma, all it means is that you're adding some things together. It just means you're adding. It's simple arithmetic, okay? Mathematics uses a lot of Greek letters to represent things. One of them that you're very familiar with is pi. Pi is a Greek letter. And pi represents uh, a relationship in a circle, which we'll talk about when we get to geometry. So, so I, wanna, I just wanted to tell you that that sigma simply means that we're adding some stuff together. I don't want anybody freaking out, okay? So when we see that sigma, we're just going to be adding some things together. So here's the formula. R equals N times sigma xy minus, now I'm just going to get this written out and then I'm going to explain it, sigma x times sigma y all divided by and this is a big ugly looking radical, but it's not that scary when, when I explain it to you n times sigma x squared minus sigma x quantity squared, I'm going to shrink that a little bit, times n times sigma y squared minus sigma y squared. That's the formula. I just copied the formula at the top of page 812. Now, folks, I know it looks really, really frightening, but I want you to take a deep breath. If you struggle with math anxiety, I'm going to talk you through this, and it's going to make so much sense that you're going to be like, what was I ever afraid of? Okay? I promise. So each of these letters has a meaning. We know what the X's and Y's are. I'm going to write out that table here in a moment. Okay? Um, the letter N is the number of points that we're talking about. So the table in the middle of page 812 says that there are six days. We're looking at the number of defective parts over a six day period. So in this problem, that simply means that n equals six. Very simple. Okay. And then they give us a table. Now what I'm going to do is at the bottom of page 812, they show us the, the table, but they've written it in vertical format. So I'm going to do that. I'm actually going to shrink the size of my 
writing. So we're going to write out a table that's going to have X, Y's in it. And then we're going to use that information to create some other values. We're going to find out what X squared is. We're going to find out what Y squared is. And we're going to find out what X, Y is. I want to remind you, we're going to do a couple of these, but I'm also going to demonstrate all of these, uh, the, all of your homework problems um, on a video that you can go and check. All right. So they give us the X, Y's. They tell us that on day one, there were three people absent and there were 15 defective parts. And they tell us that on day two, there were five people absent and 22 defective parts. Then there was nobody absent and there were seven defective parts. Then one person was absent and there were 12 defective parts. Two people were absent, 20 defective parts. And six people absent, 30 defective parts, okay? So I wanna extend this down a little bit. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna draw a line underneath the last piece of data, okay? Does anybody have any questions so far about what I just did? I don't wanna lose anybody. I just finished my coffee, so I'm going to be operating on um, just on my own energy for the rest of class. All right. <coughs> Excuse me. Good thing we're not in a real class because I imagine anybody sneezing in a face-to-face in -a -face class nowadays would be looked at like, oh my gosh. Anyway. All right, folks. So you see my X's and Y's, everybody okay with that? Now, the bottom area that we're drawing across is going to be our sigma. We're going to add those things up, okay? That's a really crappy looking sigma, okay? So this first column, we're gonna add up the X's. So three plus five is eight, plus zero is eight, plus one is nine, plus two is 11, plus six is 17. Does everybody understand how I got my 17? Any questions on that? I'm going to assume that you understand how I got these um, these values unless you, you know, unmute yourself and say, wait a minute, can you do that again? All right. So in problem uh, in, in column Y, we're going to add these together. So 15 plus 22 is 37 plus 7 is 44 plus 12 is 56 plus 20 is 76 plus 30 is 106. All right, now before we can add anything in the other three columns, we need to do something else because there's nothing in those columns. So in the third column, we're going to write the X squared value. So you look at the first column and see what the X is, and then you square it. So three squared is nine, five squared is 25, zero squared is zero, one squared is one, two squared is four, and six squared is 36. Is everybody okay with that? We good? I'll come back. And add I'll come back and add. Question? No? Okay. I'll come back and add these up in a minute. I'm going to do all of the, I'm going to do my Y squared and my XY, and then we'll come back and we'll add those columns. So now the Y squared, you look at the Y column. 15 squared is 225. 22 squared is 484. I had to look at the book because I couldn't do that one in my head. Y squared, 7 squared is 49. 12 squared is 144, 20 squared is 400, and 30 squared is 900. And then we're going to do the XY. Now, if you have two letters next to each other, what operation is occurring between them? Multiplication. Multiplication. Whoever said that, yes, exactly right. So this means we're going to multiply the X and the Y. So X times Y in the first uh, row, 3 times 15 is 45. 5 times 22 is 110. Uh, 0 times 7 is 0. 1 times 12 is 12. 2 times 20 is 40. And 6 times 30 is 180. All right? Does everybody understand how I got those values in my x squared, y squared, and xy columns? You following along okay? Now we're going to add those values together. And I'm just going to use the values in the book because They've been checked and rechecked. 
So the x squared column is 75. The y squared column is 2202. And the xy column is 387. All right. Now, remember this is your first column. This is your x column right here. So that means that sigma x is 17. And this is sigma y, which is 106. This column is sigma x squared, which is 75. Okay. Um, this column sigma y squared is 2202. And the last column sigma xy is 387. And oh yes, from the top, we remember that n equals six. Remember n is the number of points that you have. We're looking at this uh, problem over six days, so n equals six. Now I know that this is a lot of work to find these values. These are the values that you need to plug into the linear correlation coefficient. But I wanna point something out to you because when you look at the formula at the top of page 812, it looks scary. I wanna demystify it for you. That formula involves what? It involves addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponents, and square roots. Those are the basics of arithmetic. It's just written in a formula that looks really scary, but it shouldn't be scary to you when you really think about everything that's going on. We just found these values here by adding or by multiplying and then adding, okay? And those are the values that you need. You need that sigma x equals 17 and the y equals 106 and so forth. You need all of those values. Now, Hopefully you've written them down somewhere because I'm gonna to have to go to a new page to finish this problem, I believe. I'm trying to scroll down on that when it's all on my iPad. Hang on a second here. Okay. Um, see if I can add a page. It's gonna let me. Hang on a second here. Nope, I'm gonna to have to add a page here. So um, hopefully you recall that, by the way, um, in your book, at the top of page 813, they record all of this stuff, all of the, these uh, values for sigma x, sigma y, and so forth. So now I'm going to add a page, and we're going to plug all of that stuff in. All right. So... Come on, here we go. Okay. So remember that R equals N times sigma XY. I'm rewriting the, the formula. Minus sigma X times sigma Y. Mr. Yes. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna log off. Okay, if, if you have to log off, go ahead. Just make sure to come back and watch the video. Somebody's breaking up, so. I'm just rewriting the formula now. Okay, so now remember those values that we just found and I'm going to be looking at them on the top of page 813. So we're gonna plug them in, okay? So we're trying to find out what R equals. The letter N is six times sigma xy. What was sigma xy? Somebody tell me. Anybody? 106. Sigma xy? 106. Not sigma y, sigma xy. 387. Oh. 387, yep. Minus sigma x was 17. And sigma y was that 106. It's possible that I broke up and you only heard me say sigma y. That's entirely possible. That value will be your numerator. By the way, once you simplify and find that numerator, you're going to want to hold on to that value because it's going to help us in the later pro, um, part of, of this uh, content. So now on the bottom, we have the square root of n is 6 
times sigma x squared. So sigma x squared is 75 minus sigma x 17 quantity squared times 6 again times sigma y squared is 2202 minus sigma y is 106, which is then squared. So all we did here was plug in values. Okay, we just plugged in numbers. And you can see them there. And now we're going to simplify. So 6 times 387 is 2322. And 17 times 106 is 1802. Whoops. Okay. On the bottom, 6 times 75 is 450. Minus 17 squared is 289. And then 6 times 2202 is 13,212. Minus 106 squared is 11,236. Now we're going to simplify. 2322 minus 1802 is 520. And you're going to want to save that number because we're going to use it uh, to save work when we find the actual equation of the line. And then in the denominator, uh, 450 minus 289 is 161. You're going to want to save that number too. It's going to make your work later a lot easier. And then 13,212 minus 11,236 is 1976. And then you're going to use your calculator. Okay, I'm not going to work this out for you. You guys should be able to use your calculator. Find out what the square root of 161 is. It's 12 point something. Find out the square root of 1976, which is 40 something. And um, so you're going to do 520 divided by those things. And when you do that, you're going to get approximately 0 0.922. Okay. R is approximately 0 0.922. Now, what does that mean? Well, if we're on a continuum from, from negative 1, uh-oh, am I running out of space here? I am running out of a little bit of space. From negative 1 to positive 1, where 0 is right here in the middle, 0 0.922 is really close to 1. So it's a really good correlation. Think of it this way, if you got a 92% on your first test, I mean, everybody wants 100. But if you got a 92% on your first test, would you feel pretty good about it? Probably, because that's a pretty good grade. 0 0.922 is a pretty good correlation. Okay. Now, if we had gotten a number really close to zero, it would not have been a good correlation. And we would, would have just said, well, you know, the, any line we find is not going to be a very good uh, line of fit, so why bother? But because we found a really good uh, line of fit, it's 92% accurate is another way to think about it. What we can do is we can now find the equation for that line. Okay? We can find the equation for the line of best fit. I was looking to see if they used this problem any further. I was hoping they would. But anyway, all right. So. Hold on to the information about sigma x, sigma y, all that stuff. Hold on to those numbers. And what we're going to do now is we're going to find the line of best fit. We're going to skip a couple pages in the book. We are not going to talk about critical values and um, uh, whether it's uh, correlates, whether your alpha correlation is between 0.05 and 0.01. We're not going to talk about that stuff. So you don't have to worry about that on a test. So if you turn over to page 816, we're going to find out the equation. We're going to find out the information we need for the equation of the line of best fit. And the line of best fit is going to be written in slope intercept form. All right, so obviously we know that slope intercept form 
is in the form y equals mx plus b. We need to find m and b in order to plug them in to the equation. Now, I've got great news for you. At the top of page 816 where we see the formula, finding m is really, 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 really simple. I promise. I'm going to show you why. The formula for m, hang on a second, I'm going to give myself a little bit more room here. Okay. The formula for m is n times sigma xy minus sigma x times sigma y divided by n times sigma x squared minus sigma x quantity squared. Now, got a question for you. Does anybody notice anything about the, den the numerator of this fraction? Does anybody notice anything familiar? Isn't it similar to the uh, previous equation? Who's speaking here? Barbara. Barbara. Very good, Barbara. In fact, not only is it similar to, it's identical to the previous equation. It's the numerator of m is identical to the numerator of your linear correlation coefficient, right? So you don't have to recompute. If you've already found the linear correlation coefficient, you don't have to go back and do that math again. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? I don't, I can't draw it all back out. It, it would take too long, but if you flip back to page 812 and look at the numerator in the yellow box at the top and then flip back to page 816 and look at the numerator um, for your M, they're identical. Does everybody remember when I told you to, to save that numerator value? So what was that numerator value? I think I remember, but I'm not positive. I'm, was it 520? Is that right? Yes, it was. So the numerator for R was 520. Okay. So we don't have to recompute everything. We can just plug in the 520. Now, I'm going to ask you another question. Does anybody notice anything familiar about the denominator of M? Don't it's be shy. The same as the first part. Same as what first part? Of the previous equation. Of the previous equation, wh where? Where in that first part? The denominator, just minus the square root symbol. Exactly, Morgan, very good. Yeah, if you look at the R, Notice that the, under the first radical in the denominator, the n times sigma x squared minus sigma x quantity squared is the same. So what number did we get under the first radical after we did all the simplification, after we multiplied it out and we simplified it, what did we get? 161, right? Very good, 161. So you were able to find the m, which is the slope of the line, from the information you had already found when you found the correlation coefficient, okay? So now we need to find out what 520 divided by 161 is. Can anybody do that for me? I have, you have a, a calculator, divide 520 by 161 and tell me what it equals. I have a question. Okay, hold the question for a second. What did you get when you divided it? 3.2. 3.2? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, who had the question? Uh, Morgan. Okay, Morgan, go ahead. Does it matter since in the, when we solved the equation, it doesn't have the square root symbol when we redid it. Does that matter? Yes, it does. Very good, very good question. Um, when you do the M, you don't include the square root over the 161. You just use the number under the square root. That is an excellent, excellent question. If you, if you include the square root, you're going to get the wrong answer. Okay. Morgan, does that make sense? Give me a thumbs up. Perfect. Thank you.
Good. So let me recap that. Once you found your linear correlation coefficient, once you found the letter R, you have the numbers that you need to find your M, which is your slope. You don't have to recalculate. You can, there's no need to, okay? So now we know what M is. The next thing that we need to find is the B. And the formula for B involves the M. You have to find the M first. So the formula for B is sigma Y. Oh my gosh, that's a horrible looking sigma. I'm a little OCD. That's one thing that, um, that anybody who knows me well will tell you. So if I write something and it looks bad, I'll probably go back and fix it. M times sigma X divided by N. So this is the formula for B. Remember, B is the Y intercept. B is where the line crosses the Y axis. And all we need are the M value that we just found and information that we already knew. We know what sigma y is, we know what sigma x is, and we know what n is. So plugging these values in, sigma y was 106 minus 3.2 times, 3.2 is the m, I'm right there, times sigma x is 17 divided by 6. All right which is 106 minus, let's see, 3.2 times 17 is 51, 54.4, I think. I did that in my head, so if somebody checks it and I'm wrong, please tell me. And then 106 minus 54.4 is going to be 51.6, I believe. Again, check that and see if I'm, I'm, I'm doing that in my head. It's... 50, yeah, it's just 51.6. So it's 106. I think you are right. Okay, thank you. Because again, I didn't want to grab my calculator. And now divide, somebody do this for me. 51.6 divided by 6 is going to be 8 point something. Is it 8 point? It might be 8.6. Check that for me. It's 8.6. Awesome. Hey, I did that all in my head. Not too bad. Okay, so that's my B. So now we know what M is. We found M up here. We know what B is, so we can write the equation of the line Y equals 3.2X plus 8.6. This is the equation of the line. Now, <clears throat> let's go back and clarify everything we just did because I know that you were, <laughs> it's kind of like you were on a roller coaster and you're just hanging on. So let, let me recap the whole problem. You've got this company that uh, has workers who are missing, you know, absent from work and defective parts are being made. Pretend that you're the foreman at the company and you want to figure out if there's a relationship between the, <coughs> excuse me, between the number of people who are absent and the number of defective parts. And so you graph the information and you see it's not a straight line, but you're like, well, is there a relationship between missing employees and defective parts. And so you use the linear correlation coefficient, you calculate your R and you get 0.922, which tells you, you know what? There is a strong relationship between the number of people who are absent from work and the number of defective parts, which makes sense, okay? Because stuff's gonna slip through more readily when there's fewer people working. So you're like, okay, I know there's a relationship between defective parts and the people who are missing from work. Can I use that information to project how many defective parts I would have if, for example, 10 people were missing from work? Well, in order to do that, I need the equation of a line. Well, I'm going to find that equation because I know that um, the slope is this formula at the top up here, okay? I know the y-intercept is this formula in the middle and I'm gonna use that information to find the equation y equals 3.2x plus 8.6. So now you're the foreman. Your boss comes to you and goes, okay, I noticed that you know when you have people that are missing from work, you have more defective parts. What do you think is gonna happen if you have 10 people missing from work? And you can go, and by the way, I picked the number 10 at random, okay? I just want you to know that I'm picking 10 at random. 
And you could say, well, guess what? I have a formula for that. So let me tell you, boss, exactly what would happen. If 10 people are missing from work, remember that's my X. I'm gonna plug a 10 in there and that's gonna be 32 plus 8.6, which is 40.6. And of course that's approximately 41. So you can tell your boss, well, based on my information, based on statistical examination, if 10 people are missing from work, we're gonna have 41 defective parts. And your boss can say, well, that's way too many defective parts. What do we need to do in order to decrease that? And of course, then you as the foreman could say something along the lines of, well, I need more workers so that there will be fewer people who call off work and, and you know, create all these defective parts. So what I've just done here is I've tried to describe to you a scenario in which we would you know, find this information. All right. <clears throat> now we've got about 10 minutes left. <clears throat> what I wanna do is I wanna just go back and I wanna recap what it is that you're going to be doing for your homework. Um, kind of the how to. So let me um, grab my book over here. And if you would flip over to page, let's see here, flip over to page um, 820. The problems that are assigned are problems 27, 33, 35, 37, and 39. And I want you to notice that what they're asking you to do in 27 and 33 is determine the line of the equation, determine the equation of the line of best fit. So let's look at number 27 for a minute. I'm just going to help you get started, folks. That's all I'm going to do here. So let's look at problem number 27, just so you understand what it is that you're going to do. And again, I'm going to go in and record a video where I demonstrate all this. I'll do that today and I'll post it as soon as I can so that you can check your work. Problem number 27 asks you to look at the data in problem number 19. So in problem number 19, you've got a table. So this is how you're going to start this. This is what you're going to do. You're going to create a table. You're going to put in your XY's. You're also going to create a column for X squareds, Y squareds, and sigma, uh, not sigma, my bad, and XY's. You're also going to identify what n equals, all right? Now I'm just gonna copy the table there in number 19. The table says 4, 8, 5, 10, 6, 12, 7, 12, and is that 10, 16? So I'm gonna get you started. I'm not gonna do any more than get you started. Um, Obviously, you want these long enough that you can then draw a line like that. Now, <clears throat> there are five points in this problem. One, two, three, four, five. That means that your n is five, okay? Erasing those, all right. And you can do this in any order. You can do your x squareds and y squareds and xy and then add down, it doesn't matter. I probably would do that. So x squared is 16, uh, 25, 36, 49, and 100. I got that by squaring the value in the x column. y squared is going to be 64, 100, 144, uh, 144, and 16 squared is 256. Then you're gonna multiply X times Y. Be careful, by the way, this is a common mistake. People will forget that they're multiplying and they'll add, okay? In this column especially, that's a very common mistake. So make sure that you're very careful. You are going to multiply these. So four times eight is 32, five times 10 is 50, six times 12 is 72, seven times 12 is 84, and 10 times 16 is 160. And then you're gonna add the values down. I'm not gonna do that for you. You guys can do that uh, on your own. And I'm gonna, again, create this uh, in a video so that you can see it. So you'll add all your stuff down and then this'll be your sigma X, this'll be your sigma Y, this'll be your sigma X squared, your sigma Y squared, your sigma XY, 
and of course n at the top equals five. Okay. So problem number 33 asks you to do exercise 25. Notice that in exercise 25, you have six values, so n would equal six and so forth. All right. Now what I encourage you to do is I encourage you to um, find the R for 27 and 33 as well. It doesn't ask you to specifically, but it's good practice because in 35, 37, and 39, you're going to need to find the R. And now I need to tell you something very important. So let's look at problem number 35 for a moment. Problem number 35 says, <clears throat> the following data show the commuting distances and commuting times of six volunteers working at a pet shelter. How far do they travel? And how long does it take them to get there? And it shows the points. It says, determine the correlation coefficient. Let your first row be your x's and the second row be your y's. Letter B says, determine the, uh, whether a correlation exists at alpha equals 0 0.5. You do not have to do that part. In fact, I'm not even going to address it in the video. We're not talking about alpha correlations. Okay, so the same thing in number 37. It says in part B, determine whether a correlation exists at alpha equals 0 0.1, 0 0.1. And in number 39, it says determine whether a correlation exists at alpha equals 0 0.05. Do not do those parts. We're not talking about alpha correlations. All right. So those are your five homework problems. I'm going to, uh, when we get off of this call, I'm going to uh, save this video and start uploading it to YouTube. And then while it's doing that, I am going to create a video for these five homework problems. Before we go, I want to make certain that I didn't miss anybody. Uh, did Barbara Carbajal make it? Yes. Okay, Barbara, thank you. How about Jocelyn Cisneros, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, how about um, Blaine Getz? Are you here, Blaine? Crystal Mays? Okay. All right. Real quick, before we get off, um, what did you say the homework problems were? I'm sorry, I didn't get that. They are in the module. Uh, I closed my book, so let me flip it back open. Um, here we go. So they're in uh, module three. This is section 12.6, so it's pages 820 and 821. Problems 27, 33, 35, 37, and 39. Got it? Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Carly, do you have anything that you want to say or share regarding SI? Um, so next week, just both of the sessions, Monday and Wednesday, we're going to do four to six, and we're going to do some exam review on both of them. Awesome. Awesome. And remember, Carly does uh, record those, I believe, yes? As long as I get attendance, I record them. Right, right. She's not going to record a blank screen if nobody's there, but if even one person shows up, she'll record it. Um, but I wouldn't rely on that. I wouldn't rely on, oh, somebody will show up because that doesn't always happen. And she's an excellent resource for you. So any other questions? All right, everybody. Well, then I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to bring this class to a close. I will uh, get this video and a homework video for 12.6 posted, hopefully today. And I will, uh, again, uh, I will try and get your practice tests graded and posted by tomorrow. All right, everybody. Have a great day. We'll see you. Have a nice weekend.